In this video, we want to look at the aircraft certification process. This is going to be an overview. It's not going to be an in-depth, uh, and we're just going to look at selected uh, issues here. So we want to look at the aviation re regulation framework, uh, um, what's called uh, Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, which applies to the FAA and pertinent parts within it. It's chunked into parts. And particularly, we want to look at Part 25, uh, Section 1301, and Part 25, Section 1309. And then we'll look at advisory circular, what's called advisory circular AC 25-1309A. Uh, it's actually 1A uh, for how to comply with the uh, 14 CFR 25-1309. And that's sort of how this stuff reads when you're in the business. I mean, you're, you're just spouting off uh, uh, acronyms and, and numerical references to a text. So we'll get into some of those here in a minute. When we get done with this uh, module, you ought to be able to explain the uh, What's the essence of, of these two parts in particular, 25.13.01 and 25.13.09? And then uh, explain how the advisory circular 25.13.09.1a uh, defines extremely unlikely, unlikely, et cetera. Uh, that is the probabilities of uh, uh, certain events that are extremely unlikely, unlikely, uh, probable, et cetera. And then there's going to be these, these uh, uh, supporting documents. Uh, some from the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, Aeronautical, Aeronautical Something Protocol, 4754 and 4761, and then these documents from the uh, RTCA, which used to be the Radio Telecommunications Commission for Avionics, uh, Aviation, uh, uh, particularly their document 178C and their document 274, and how these figure into aircraft certification. Uh, that third bullet we'll look at in the uh, next uh, lecture, uh, today, we want to talk about uh, 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 the, the, the federal regulation framework and, and this advisory circular and how it, advise, how it gives us guidance uh, uh, to uh, do the uh, certification. So aviation regulations uh, are established in the regulatory environment. Regulatory law was not part of uh, statute law. It's not part of statute law. It's regulatory law. It's administrative law, it's called. And look, I'm not a lawyer, so this is uh, this is not a lawyer speaking. This is a, a, a an engineer talking about law uh, and regulatory law, and these are established uh, through statute law. And statute law in the USA uh, is uh, uh, the United States Code (USC). It's not the, uh, either the University of Southern California or the University of South Carolina. Uh, uh, so we're talking about the U.S. Code and Title V. It's chunked into titles, and Title V establishes regulatory procedures. Again, these were not envisioned at all at the time of the uh, writing of the Constitution, and it hasn't really been, uh, it's been implemented through uh, uh, statute law and then court findings. Uh, there's really no uh, larger framework that says there is an administrative legal process. But this started in the 19th century with like the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, 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 and there was, of course, a set of court cases about whether Congress can regulate interstate commerce. Uh, or intrastate commerce and when intrastate commerce is really interstate commerce and things like that. Uh, and then uh, later through uh, 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 the Food and Drug Administration and the like, you said telecommunications, the uh, FCC, Federal Communications Commission, and the like, uh, uh, you see regulatory bodies come into play and become part of, uh, uh, of the uh, legal framework of the U.S., uh, uh, and, of course, there are different camps. Uh, uh, there are people who are, uh, you know, strongly against regulatory law and administrative law and, and think that it's government overreach, and there are people who, who understand why we have to have it. And even, you know, uh, it's ironic that, you know, in a, in a field like aviation, you have a, a lot of people who, and, and for, for a lot of their politics, might be against administrative law, and yet they're working in one of the more regulated industries, and they understand why there have to be regulations just to ensure safety. Uh, so the FAA and the Department of Transportation are established under Title 49 of the United States Code, and it also gives the FAA authority to regulate uh, uh, using the regulatory procedures in Title V. The regulations that are issued uh, uh, by the various agencies of the United federal, federal Government are collected into what's called the Code of Federal, federal Regulations, CFR. Uh, and again, these, like the laws, have titles and chapters and parts and subparts, et cetera. Uh, Title, 40, Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations is about aeronautics in space, and Chapter 1, uh, uh, which is Parts 1 through 199, uh, uh, concerns the FAA, and these are what are called the FARs or the Federal Aviation Regulations. Uh, in in federal, term, uh, federal legalese, FAR now means Federal Accounting Regulations or something, and so legally you can't say FARs, but uh, there's a lot of people who still say the FARs. 
Uh, parts 200 and 399 have to do with the proceedings of the FAA and uh, the Department of Commerce or Department of Transportation. Uh, commercial space transports in parts 400 to 1200, uh, and then 1200 to uh, 1299 is NASA. Uh, so space is, again, it's aeronautics uh, and space. Of interest to us, uh, part 21 talks about certification procedures. And so there's different types of certificate associated uh, there's a type, type design certificate or a type certificate associated with the design of an aircraft. So every aircraft has a type certificate. Uh, and if you change the design, you get a supplemental type certificate. Uh, there's an airworthiness certificate for the aircraft. So the type certificate talks about the design and the airworthiness talks about the actual aircraft itself. There's a manufacturing certificate that says this factory is uh, certified to produce aircraft of this type. And when they leave this factory, we can give them an airworthiness certificate. So it's all, it's all kind of uh, complicated and they relate to each other and uh, uh, they mix together and the like. Uh, uh, but so we're really going to be talking about the type certificates, uh, uh, the design certificate here. And there's really different parts uh, for different kinds of aircraft. Uh, part 23 uh, refers to uh, what the FAA calls normal uh, aviation or general, what we would call general aviation. And uh, in operations, this is largely aircraft smaller than 20 passengers. Uh, so uh, everything from your, uh, your, uh, 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 172s and one, uh, one, 152s uh, uh, and your Piper Cubs uh, all the way up to uh, uh, your Gulf Streams uh, and the like. Uh, it, it mentions uh, acrobatic aircraft and of course the aerobatic aircraft people and the flight team and people like that will tell you it's aerobatic and not acrobatic uh, and the like. Uh, part 25 has to do with transport category aircraft. That's your, uh, uh, you know, your uh, 707s and 747s and 787s, et cetera. 27 is what they call normal rotorcraft. So your little Robinsons and stuff like that. And then part 29 are your larger transport category aircraft, uh, uh, which are largely uh, 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 repurposes of uh, what were originally military design. So uh, your big cargo, uh, you know, lifting cranes and uh, putting air conditioning units on top of skyscrapers, those kind of uh, rotorcraft and things like that. Part 33 is engines, part 35 is props, and uh, part 39 has to do with airworthiness directives and how they're issued. So under five and uh, uh, all actually under all four, 23, 25, 27, 29, each of these has a, a part 1301. And <clears throat> part 1301, uh, there's more to it than these part, uh, sections one through four, but it says pretty simple. Each item of installed equipment must be of a kind of design appropriate to its intended function, and it has to function properly when installed. So it has to be what it says it's going to be, and it has to work right. All right, so that's both part, you know, and it's funny, but you think legally you have to put that in there because, you know, you have to say what it is and what it's going to do, and you have to say it ought to do what it's going to do. <clears throat> it seems funny to have to articulate that, but really you do. Nine, uh, 1309 for each of these has to do with a little more detail on this. And so I'm going to read part of this. Equipment, systems, and installations whose function is required by this subchapter must be designed to ensure that they perform their intended function under any foreseeable operating conditions. So not only has it got to work, it's got to work, period, any foreseeable operating condition. And then B says, uh, airplane systems and associated components considered separately and in relation to other systems must be designed so, one, the occurrence of any failure condition which would prevent the air continued safe flight and landing of the airplane is extremely improbable. It has to be extremely improbable that you're not going to have continued safe flight and landing. It has that is, crashes, accidents have to be extremely you know improbable. And, and the occurrence of other failure conditions, which would reduce the capacity of the airplane or ability of the crew, is improbable. So uh, improbable. So again, it has to. Uh, it's just you just you can't have failures. Uh, you, you, this is about the likelihood of failures. C says you have to warn the crew when things are going wrong. <clears throat> and then D says compliance with the requirements of B, it's got to work, must be shown by analysis or where necessary by appropriate ground flight or simulator test. And the analysis can be failure modes. Uh, it can be uh, probability of multiple failures and undetected failures. Uh, and you, I mean, you have to consider these and you have to consider the effect on the airplane and its occupants, what stage of flight you're in, uh, operating conditions, et cetera. And then what crew warnings and corrective, I mean, how can you advise the crew about what they can do? 
uh, there's this line here about, again, this is about uh, uh, electrical generation. It, uh, it has to, uh, 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 there can be what's called technical standing orders, uh, standard orders about uh, environmental test procedures, about, uh, about uh, uh, generators and stuff. Uh, anyways, there's, there's other ways for electrical systems and uh, equipment design, uh, uh, you know, for, for demonstrating compliance uh, under other terms for technical standard orders. Uh, EWIS is electrical wiring uh, 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 interfacing systems. Uh, uh, this is wiring harnesses. This is uh, 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 sockets and, and jacks and uh, uh, plugs and stuff. And they have their own requirements in uh, 251709. So here's what's going to matter for, for us about uh, 251309. Things have to work under all foreseeable conditions. Failures have to be extremely improbable. And reduced capacity uh, has to be improbable. So again, there's the difference here. As you can see, we've already quali quantified, qualified really, uh, the difference. We, and we'll quantify these at some point. You have to be able to identify this uh, uh, to the crew, uh, uh, the system monitoring. You have to give failure warnings. You have to give them in, in indication of what needs to happen. And you can demonstrate compliance by analysis uh, articulating the failure modes, you have to say what the likelihood of failure, of multiple failures, of undetected failures is, and you have to be able to say how it impacts the crew. So how does a manufacturer supposed to demonstrate this compliance? I mean, uh, and so the FAA says, well, you've read the regulations uh, in 14 CFR 25.1309. Here, we'll give you a circular. Here's Advisory Circular 25.1309-1A, System Design and Analysis, uh, it's a structured means for showing compliance. So let's uh, look at a little bit of what's in this advisory circular uh, 25. <clears throat> advisory circular 25.1309 about it's talking about fail-safe operations. In any system or subsystem, the failure of a single element, component, or connection during one flight should be assumed regardless of its probability. Such single failures should not prevent continued safe flight and landing or significantly reduce the capability of the airplane or the ability of the crew to cope with resulting failure conditions. So failure is presumed. It's not failure is not an option. Failure is presumed, and you have to figure out how to make the plane work in spite of failure. And then subsequent failures, uh, whether detected or latent in combination, should also be assumed unless you can show their joint probability with the first failure is extremely improbable. So again, there's have this phrase, extremely improbable. So uh, here's a, a rank ordering of failure conditions. The, the, the terms used by the FAA in this advisory circular to talk about failure conditions uh, uh, from uh, lesser to greater. Uh, so minor failures uh, do not reduce uh, uh, safety. Uh, and don't really require crew actions beyond what they normally would be doing, whereas ma major failures reduce the capability of the airplane uh, or the crew to cope with adverse uh, operating conditions. So minor failures could be, uh, oh, you know, a, a warning light going out or a warning light uh, blinking, you know, or something, uh, whereas a major failure could be something like uh, a landing gear uh, doesn't go down or a landing gear doesn't indicate that it's going down. And so the crew has to do extra things like go down, you know, landing, landing gear did not lock, uh, uh, but the crew can go back or the indicator light says the landing gear didn't lock. You know, the crew can go back and there's a panel in the aisle and you pick up the carpet. I've been on a flight where they do this before and they open this, this uh, hatch and they, they've got a periscope. So they can actually visually inspect whether the landing gear uh, was down. But that's an extra capability that, you know, the crew has to go above and beyond to do that. Uh, so the crew workload is increased. So a major uh, uh, failure uh, uh, reduces the capability of the aircraft. I mean, if the landing gear actually weren't down, it would have to land, do a, a gear down landing. Uh, 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 not fun. I've not been in one, but I... Uh, <laughs> We flew a Cessna 310 up, which is a powerful twin, uh, up to Atlantic City one time to the uh, William J. Hughes Technical Center for the FAA. Uh, uh, and the guy uh, dropped us off, uh, who we flew up with. Uh, and then he had to go to the FAA headquarters in D.C., so he flew back to D.C. And then he came to pick us up in Atlantic City. And when he was coming into Atlantic City, the gear did not lock on the way down. And he knew it, and, and they did a flyover. And they're like, yeah, your gear's not down. And he had to do a belly landing. And, you know, it was fine. I mean, just, you know, damage to the plane and, and stuff, but nobody got hurt and there were no flames or anything like that. Just a lot of embarrassment. Uh, and yet, uh, um, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's not what you want to happen. So you don't want failures like that. 
catastrophic failures are, uh, uh, well, major failure, I want to note there are significant major failures and they're severe. Uh, and, and severe, of course, is uh, more than significant, I believe. Uh, uh, so then catastrophic failure is just, you know, you're not, <laughs> people are going to die. Uh, that's a catastrophic failure. A plane blows up in the sky or a, a plane crashes on landing or something like that because of uh, some kind of uh, a technical device failure. So we've talked about, you've heard the terms about uh, highly improbable, uh, uh, extremely improbable, improbable, and uh, the like. And, and we want to correlate that with this uh, uh, sort of failure conditions and, and uh, likely uh, uh, the impact that would have on the crew and, and the aircraft uh, if the failure happened. And that lets us uh, sort of, <clears throat> what we're actually doing here is quantifying risk, <clears throat> excuse me, your qualifying risk uh, uh, here. On the horizontal axis, we've rank ordered probability from uh, in increasing probability to the right. So, uh, 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 excuse me, decreasing probability. So you have probable events, improbable events, and then extremely improbable events. And then the on the vertical axis, we've ranked uh, uh, sort of failure conditions. Uh, again, normal nuisance, uh, abnormal procedures, emergency procedures, damage to the aircraft, impact, negative impact on, on the crew or, or passengers, and then a catastrophic accident. And you can see there's sort of a, a trade-off between these. You're willing to accept uh, normal and nuisance failures uh, uh, and uh, abnormal procedures, uh, more willing to accept that than a catastrophic accident. And so the degree of likelihood uh, has to... Uh, 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 become less. And so again, uh, since we're increasing, uh, 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 le decreasing likelihood as we increase, as we go to the right, there's this diagonal that sort of is our acceptable level of risk and risk being sort of a combination of, uh, of consequences and probability. So we can accept low consequences with high probability and, and uh, uh, high consequences with low probability. And that's really what this uh, chart is indicating here. So we're going to look at these, uh, uh, the supporting documents, the SAE and, and RTCA documents uh, in the next lecture. To summarize what we've got here. Uh, aviation regulations are in Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, or they're called the FARs. Uh, parts 23, 25, 27, 29 uh, uh, address general aviation airplanes and transport airplanes, and then GA rotorcraft and transport rotorcraft, respectively. 1301 says the system's got to do what they say they're going to do. And then 1309 says that failure, uh, a catastrophic failure has to be extremely unlikely. Uh, uh, failures reducing aircraft and crew capacity have to be unlikely. And then advisory circular 25-1309-1A, uh, this is not right anywhere in the slides, uh, details the meaning of compliance for 25-1309 and defines extremely unlikely, unlikely, et cetera. We'll talk about those numbers the next time. And uh, we'll also talk about how you use SAE, ARP 4754, and 4761 to do the system decomposition for safety. This is where we talk about how to do redundancy, uh, how to do uh, uh, things like fault tree analysis, functional hazard analysis, and stuff like that. And then these uh, RTCA documents, 178C and 274, uh, tell us how we can get uh, comp uh, uh, software. Uh, 178C is to do software. And then 274 for complex electronic hardware, how we get those done. So that'll be in the next lecture.